Hello, Kristen. Hi, Julie. How Hi, are everyone. you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Skelton, and I am the founder of Bud Funding, a social enterprise dedicated to sustainable education. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I have a special guest with me, and her name is Julie Walker. Julie, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm lovely. Thank you. How are you? Good. So you're surviving the heat wave, the little heat wave we're having? Absolutely. Swam in my first creek the other day. Nice. So a little bit about Julie. Julie is the owner and program director of Full Circle Adventures. She has a bachelor degree in physical education with a major in outdoor pursuits from the University of Calgary. Since 1987, Julie has built a successful career in business as a professional hiker, guider, uh, and she works extensively in Kananaskis country, country, the Whaleback and Banff National Park. Her focus is to build an understanding of wild food harvesting through the plant and animal communities who depend on each other. This knowledge helps develop best practices to protect the fragility of our natural food ecosystem. Julie's vision is to engage and educate landowners, gardeners, foragers, the outdoor recreation community about the value of preserving in of preserving intact wildland. So we're going to dive right in. But uh, I know you were just on an excursion this past weekend. Where where did you go? Okay, yeah, so I had a couple of different things going on this weekend. Um, I did a private excursion um, in the sort of Bragg Creek, west of Bragg Creek area on some private land. So we walked there, they have 160 acres. We didn't walk the whole 160 acres, but we walked a lot of it looking for what kind of edible and medicinal plants they have on their property, which is really exciting. Um, and where else did I go? I've done a few things. I was in, in the city at Weasel Head with a light cellar Thursday evening doing an edible plant walk. Um, yeah, so all over the place. Very cool. I know you're a very busy lady. So what are some of the edible plants that we could find if we went on a walk um, around Alberta? And would you say there's a difference between maybe Northern Alberta and Southern Alberta? Yeah. Yes, there's a huge difference. So even from like Red Deer North, you're in a, you'll find plants there you will not find anywhere else in the province. And so then from Red Deer South to about Longview, uh, south of Okotoks is a what another ecoregion. We're actually in what's called the Palliser Triangle here, which means we're in a semi-arid climate zone. And when you go north, like well, central Alberta, but Edmonton and north, mm -hmm. you're actually in a more humid climate zone. And then when you go from Highway 3 south, there's a whole other plant and uh, forest ecosystem there that you do not find anywhere else. So there'll be some overlapping plants. Um, but we definitely have four different, you know, very substantial ecoregions, well, five if you go far enough north in Alberta, and so you will find different plants in these places. We also mm -hmm. actually have a couple of unglaciated areas when the Wisconsin Glacier Field was actually, Calgary was, they called it, uh, we were on a beach property, beachfront property on the edge of an ocean back then, mm -hmm. and Calgary itself was like a glacial lake. Um, there were a couple of hills like the Cypress Hills, Porcupine Hills, the Whaleback area did not get glaciated. So their soil never got scraped. So they even have a rich abundance that you don't find other places. And what are some of the edible plants that we would find if we went on a walk? So one that's fairly common and it's also what they call circumpolar, which means that it's all over the Northern hemisphere. Our common name is fireweed and I should have brought my I think it's Augusta epilobium for that Latin name. Um, and that it, part of why it's common is that it's actually a rejuvenating plant after forest fires. So after a fire, a lot of the minerals and things are burnt out of the soil and vegetation. And some of the stuff is burnt into the charcoal, some of the minerals. So fireweed comes and it actually absorbs all the potassium and phosphorus. And then when it dies, it triples the amount of these nutrients back into the soil. 
So it's like um, not only a regeneration, but almost like a trauma heal. So mm -hmm. it also likes growing in cultivated lands that are the way dandelions like to grow and break up the soil and get the nutrients in there. Um, fireweed does that. So it's very soil restoring and um, fairly common. And when it does grow, it has lateral or rhizomous roots. So it grows in large plant communities. So if you find fireweed often, there'll be large plant communities. So you can you know, harvest 10% and not impact it. So. I've heard you talk a lot about fireweed and I'm like, I need to find some of that. Cause I think you said it tastes a little bit like asparagus. Is that right? Yeah, and it's easiest to think of it as wild asparagus when it comes to cooking, because it's the young stalk, just like an asparagus stalk, and the leaves, the young leaves and stalk. But as soon as it gets to a fairly tall height, the stem gets far too woody. And generally, mm -hmm. so at a young stem will generally be, you know, late May mm -hmm. to maybe mid June. And then, you know, by solstice, they're definitely too tall, too woody. They're just not, they're just not tender and delicious to eat anymore. Mm -hmm. But thinking of it as asparagus helps you. Well, how would I cook asparagus? Oh, well, that's how I could cook, you know, the stalk and young leaves of fireweed. And where else in the world could we find that? Could we find fireweed? You could find it in Russia. You could probably find it in Northern Eurasia. Um, Definitely up in the Yukon and Alaska. Um, so as I say, sort of that Northern hemisphere, actually you could probably even find it in the Northern states um, mm -hmm. in certain climate zones and in certain forest ecosystems. Um, but so definitely the Northern hemisphere and all the way around the globe. So, but the, the, the reason why the Latin name is so important so that for a plant like that, in Russia, they might call it, well, it's something in Russian, but even if you translate it, it might be like, um, I don't know, forest weed or something. And you go, no, that's fireweed. And they go, no, this is fireweed. So if you say, well, Augusta epilobium, then they go, oh yeah, that's this. Now you have the same plant because common names are common to a geographic area, to a cultural history. And that's why the Latin names are important. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. And so you can kind of prepare it like asparagus, maybe like saute it in a little uh, fry pan with some butter. But of course, you need a guide to show you how to, the proper way to collect it. Don't just go collecting some random stuff in, in the grass without proper education is all I'm trying to say. Awesome. Awesome. Um, okay, so I know you're big on sustainable and ethical practices. And I know you mentioned only collecting 10% of of uh, a wild plant. So do you have other uh, sustainable and ethical techniques um, to share while you would harvest? Absolutely. So I'm gonna say goldenrod is another example, just to give you another plant to work with. Um, so goldenrod, you want it, you could, there's two seasons for harvesting. Often plants have three seasons of harvesting, depending on what part you're after. And that's part of the motivation for not over harvesting in the, in the earliest season, right? Because you might wanna come back and get another part for another time of the year. So with goldenrod, you can, um, the young stems and leaves, it's a bitter, so it cleans out your digestive system. So you wanna get it before the flowers grow. But because later you might wanna come back and get the flowers for tea, rather than snipping you know, five plants, um, you might wanna just take two leaves per plant when you're doing it, because it's not the stem you're really after, it's the leaves. Okay. So if you just snip, snip two leaves per plant. And when I say 10%, so part of the key is, and part of what if people don't have the background to realize is that, is this a healthy population of goldenrod? If I see five, oh, is that a lot of goldenrod? Not really. Goldenrod tend to go grow in communities of you know 50 or 100. And then you could take 5% of, 10% of 50 is five. You know, you'd either take five plants or leave them to be pollinated and have the flowers later. So just go to those plants and take two leaves per plant so they can still photosynthesize. It kind of requires um, a relational thinking, you know, and thinking long term in order to understand what's really best for the plants and still sustainable for you to come back and harvest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so because you're saying maybe you can harvest a little bit in the beginning and then a little bit after. So would there be a difference in taste if you harvest at different times? Well, again, well, if it's leaves you're after for tea. So I, so for example, with fireweed, I'll harvest the young stems, you know, in early June. 
Um, and then as they get taller, because the leaves actually on a young fireweed stem are close to the stem, and then they open up um, as it gets more mature. So when the leaves are fully opened and doing their photosynthesis, then all the nutrients are in the leaves, then that's when I want to harvest it for tea. So you're thinking, what stage of the life cycle is it? What time of year? Where are the nutrients right now? Are they in the root, the stem, the leaves, or the flower? So when it's in the leaves, that's when I'm going to come back and just you know take a bunch of leaves or potentially take some plants, depending on if there's over 100 fireweed plants, then I might harvest 10 plants and just strip the leaves off when I get home. If there's less than that, I might strip the leaves, a couple of leaves off every plant. So when it's in full photosynthesis, then that's where the nutrients are for the, for the tea, right? Mm -hmm. And okay. if you get too late, so if a plant's gone to seed, the leaves are actually now in their decay process. So they're actually draining all of their nutrients. Okay. And can you share a little bit of the signature of plant, what that means and maybe what we could look for? Yes. So that probably goes back to 14, 15, 1600s and it's called the doctrine of signatures. So in Europe, um, when they were doing, you know, leeches and bloodletting <laughs> as a medical practice, this idea of doctrine of signatures was part of the plant medicine. So it's like, oh, so this plant, Talbu lungwort, the leaves are shaped like a lung. So I bet you it's good for the lungs. And so, oh, this plant, the leaves are heart shaped. Oh, I bet it's good for the heart. So that concept is doctrine of signatures. And we've certainly seen that with avocado and walnuts, you know, walnuts good for the brains, avocado good for the ovaries, you know, so that's that idea of doctrine of signatures. Now I haven't done a lot of research on how effective that was or how maybe that was kind of a novice approach to understanding the plants as opposed to say the Weechel First Nations where an indigenous person who's the medicine person would actually spend time with a plant, you know, taste it, do dreaming, do fasting and talk to this plant spirit. And the plant spirit would tell that person what it's for, how to use it, how to process it. And that's where a lot of the First Nations knowledge came from. So in terms of which method is more effective, mm -hmm. right? So. Right. No, that's, yeah, that's cool. I, I heard of that recently and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder where, you know, where that originated from. Um, so I want to know what's one of the most interesting things that you've come across while foraging? Interesting, tasty or interesting looking? <laughs> Give us both. Okay. Well, actually, you know, there's an introduced species that uh, according to agricultural definitions as a weed, but I don't think it is. Um, and it often grows in moister habitats and ponds and stuff. And it's called curled dock. And curled dock, unfortunately, it doesn't grow in great numbers, like a lot, a lot of it. I wish it did grow more because if you get curled dock early enough in the season, the leaves have a very specific shape. And when you snip off a leaf and chew it, it's got a lemony rhubarb flavor. And um, I remember one of the first years I was out with the chefs west of Turner Valley from the Sate Cooking School, mm -hmm. uh, at the, the profs who were chefs. And we did a forage at Diamond Willow Artisan Retreat. And I found, oh, I found about five curled dock plants, which is exciting. So we harvested a leaf or two from each plant. And one of the chefs just, we tasted them. And then one of the chefs just um, wrapped the fish in curled dock leaves and put it on the barbecue. And so that's how we got the lemony flavor into the fish. So that was um, very cool. That's really cool. So what does that plant kind of look like? Uh, it's a tall, if you know goat's beard, which is kind of a relative of dandelion, it has a tall stem like that. And uh, the leaves are quite long and it's called curl dock because not only do they kind of curl up this way, but they curl a little bit inside, um, you know, up. Mm -hmm. And they have a strong white vein down the middle. Um, and you can nibble on the end of the leaf. And if it doesn't have a lemon rhubarb flavor, it's not curled dock. It tends to be more prairie, a little bit in the Eastern foothills, uh, but the Calgary is actually in a prairie ecoregion. Um, it has a few mixed e ecoregions within it because of the river valleys, but it's basically a prairie ecoregion. And so the place I see it most abundantly, unfortunately, is in like sloughs east of Calgary. And you don't know if in a crop, a field so you don't know what chemicals and fertilizers are in the slough that's where it's really abundant mm -hmm. but when it's out in this way more in grazing areas where there's less chemicals it's kind of nice to see it 
It has so, some relatives. So one of the relatives people might recognize is called sheep sorrel. And uh, sheep sorrel has, um, boy, I wish I had a black pillow or something. Um, these, these long skinny leaves, but at the bottom, mm -hmm. they hook in on each side. Like they have a little loop in the bottom of the leaves. Um, boy, I should have done this in the garden. I could have walked around and picked things. <laughs> and it's very lemony and it's related to um, mountain sorrel. So some of the alpine, subalpine hikers might know mountain sorrel. Okay, so the it must have um, the like the plant that you guys use to wrap the salmon must have pretty big leaves in order to like wrap the salmon, right? Yeah, they're quite long, so you know, um, well, that would be a younger leaf, and then they can get you know longer than my spread. Of, well, um, about that long, the full length of my yeah. palm that way. Um, but the younger ones are a little less, or just laying them on top too on the fish. So yeah, that's very cool. So I want to know what your favorites are. What are your favorite plants to harvest and why? Oh, that's a hard one because I love every one when I'm with it <laughs> and for different uses. Um, so I do love harvesting fireweed because it's so abundant and so beautiful. And I actually do grow it in my backyard and it does have three seasons of edibility. It, so it has the stem and then the leaves for tea and then the flowers for garnish. And the flowers also actually attract the native pollinating bees as well as the um, hummingbirds. So that's kind of a nice thing to have. Uh, there's a plant that's been on the planet since uh, dinosaur times. And it's a huge, like a maple leaf, but different, huge broad leaf plant. And its flowering stem can get up to seven feet tall and it has a big white flower on the top and the, the flowering pattern is this big white flower they call it an umbrella like the top of my hat and so the flower is like this this big round mound that's full of little tiny flowers in a big mound like that and that's that's how we identify it when it's flowering but that's not when we want to harvest it so we have to be able to identify it when it's younger without the flowering stock to harvest it but it's called cow parsnip and um it's one, again, you've got to identify it right. It has some contraindications. For example, it's very fuzzy. So I've been doing this 12 years and I've had one person who's uh, kind of allergic to the sun or sun sensitive. And this plant is what's called photovoltaic. So if you rub the hairs on your arm or something, then that section of your arm can't prevent you from getting sunburn. You'll really easily sunburn. Wow. So that's what photovoltaic is. Um, but like I said, I've had one person in 10 years that's had that issue, but I do have learned to ask people, you know, anybody here allergic to the sun? But anyway, it's a young stalk and the young leaves, and um, it has a parsnip flavor and a celery texture. And because I work with a lot of different chefs and, um, cul cul you know, culinary people and distilleries, I've been blown away by all the ways people can cook it. For example, uh, um, I'm gonna not say his name right. So I'll just say, I know a fellow, he's a Japanese chef. He was on our uh, program recently. And uh, the first time we took them out with a the cow parsnip on this first talk I was talking about, he actually did tempura with the um, young cow parsnip leaves while the rest of us were stuffing cheese into the hollow stalks and stir frying it, so. Yeah, it just takes a little creativity, hey? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And you also have to peel the hairs off the outer stem um, because especially as a first timer, your body has to really get used to these plants. Mm -hmm. There's oxalates and alkaloids um, in plants that our bodies aren't used to. And if we have too much of one plant, we can actually make ourselves sick. So we have to really go slow and gentle. Right. And um, so, so you'd say that that one is kind of your favorite? or those two? One of my top three, one of yeah. my top three. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very I've yet to successfully dig up licorice root. So I see wild licorice growing. And the one time I tried it, it was like, I need a watering can and a couple of hours and a hori hori knife because if I want to get a root, I've got to go down like two feet okay. to get this root, you know? But we do have licorice root in the prairies here, We're wild licorice, which is kind right. of cool. So, but you have to go down quite far to access the edible part? Yeah, to get the whole root, not leave the best part in the ground, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now let's switch gears a little bit to um, our homes. 
because I know that, um, you know, our pollinators are so important, our native pollinators, and what's the easiest way to support our pollinators? Well, it's by planting native plants. So can you talk to us a little bit about rewilding um, our home and garden lawn? Maybe, uh, you know, what that takes, some examples you've worked on in the past, a little bit of that. Absolutely. So just to give you a basics part of why rewilding your mm -hmm. lawn and gardens is important is so native insects and native plants have built this relationship over time. Plants produce chemicals to fight off insects. Insects have produced enzymes to not die from these chemicals. So when you bring in introduced plants, the insects don't have these enzymes. So the insects aren't able to eat all of these introduced plants. And when the birds arrive in the spring, they all feed their babies insects. We all love these songbirds and whatever. So if we are putting introduced plants everywhere, we're actually breaking the food chain. So that's an ecological reason. Mm -hmm. uh, more, a more uh, self-serving reason why it's really great to have the native plants. So I have uh, four native plants in the garden that I started eating in mid-May. So I've been eating my native plants and making soups and making stews and doing stir fries and making tea and making salad um, for two months almost already. You know, well, this year because of the heat, it was actually even earlier, so early May. So yeah, almost two months. So now your food season, instead of waiting and waiting and waiting till August to actually have your wild your food, you've got your wild food in the spring, you've got your cultivated food food in the fall so now you have a much longer you know season to harvest preserve eat fresh 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 foods where you get all the nutrients and your your soil improves your because they drop nutrients from the soil they decompose and put nutrients back in the soil so letting things decompose where they are is really important to add those nutrients to the soil um yeah and then that makes your body stronger too absolutely so some of the ones oh go ahead so some of the ones i've worked with so in my front lawn, I'm I, I, well. I'm doing construction right now, so I'm not going to plant them until the fence is done. However, uh, there's a couple of things. I have a north-facing front lawn, and I have spruce trees in the front lawn. So when I'm in the forest, I'm like, okay, what can grow under spruce trees? What likes the shade? What likes north-facing? So there's a plant called western wood violet, and at the moment, I've got it in the back under my apple trees. So um, buying Western wood violet plugs, five or six of them, planting them in a shady spot, they'll do well. Not right under the evergreen, but out in the edge of the canopy of the leaf, of the boughs, of the needles, um, of the branches. And so that one is a salad green. You can eat the flowers, you can eat the leaves, you can eat the stems, you know, you don't eat the roots and that's great because you want it to continue growing. And mine's just finishing flowering now. So again, I've been eating it for a couple of months as a flowering, as a salad green. And then I'm also putting um, bearberry or knick-knick and dwarf dogwood in the front after we finish the construction. And I want to have enough dwarf dogwood that when the little teeny berries are ripe, that I have so many of them that I could actually, you know, collect some and sprinkle them on stuff, but also reduce mowing the lawn, also start creating that soil biodiversity mm -hmm. so that I could put in some, maybe some berry shrubs in the front that'll do better because it won't all be spruce needles, you know. And then in the back, I've got fireweed. I have a wonderful stand of fireweed. I mean, I harvested it at three times to make the young, you know, the, the young vegetable of the stock. And then I harvested it twice to get, make my tea. And I'm like, wow, I still have so much of this. And that happens every year. I have so much. It's great. Mm -hmm. And then I also have stinging nettle in the back. So I've been making nettle soup. I've made like four nettle soups. I've harvested a whole bunch to dry for nettle tea. And now I'm leaving it because it's gone to seed. Um, Another so nice for that one, just to back yeah. up for a second for the nettle. So which part of the plant would you harvest? So when nettle's young, I just snip. There's maybe so the top of nettle, and then there's a group of two leaves, and then there's another group of leaves. So under maybe the third group of leaves, I just snip the stem with leather gloves, <laughs> put it yeah. in my basket, and just go and snip. I don't snip the whole the whole uh, bunch of them, but I. I snip a lot of them and often they'll grow two more stems out from the main stem after you've snipped them. You can then go re-harvest. And then when I'm doing the leaves, um, again, because of my drying technique, I'll just snip a bunch more stems, hang them to dry or put them in my hanging basket to dry. Um, 
And the antidote to stinging nettle is actually the curled dock or the sorrel, which I also have in the garden. Yay. <laughs> and those usually, like I heard that um, the, if there's like a poisonous plant, usually the antidote plant will grow close to that poisonous plant. Is that correct? Uh, from what I know, yes, there I know some poisonous plants out there and I don't know what the antidote is, so I don't know what would be the one that grows, but um, but I have heard that and I don't know if that's a European old wives tale or North American okay. old wives tale. We'll have to get to the bottom of that. Rhymes, garden rhymes actually come from Europe, right? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, so what are the benefits um, can you share the benefits? What would be some of the potential plants um, to add for maybe a starter, a very beginner? Um, like what would you say would be something easy to add for a, um, someone just starting out to their- So to the their wild violets, yep. Yeah. So like a early blue violet is one of the, viol all the violet members, family members, there's three in Alberta. Uh, one's quite rare actually. So the early blue violet's fairly prolific. And it's an easy one, like it can grow anywhere in your lawn, the bottom of your deciduous tree, not an evergreen tree. So you could plant it a lot of places. Um, it could take over, like, like have instead of lawn kind of thing. And you can eat the leaves and flowers. It's easy to recognize. There's nothing toxic about it. Um, it's a nice, safe one. So early blue violet or western wood violet in a shade spot. Those would be an easy one where you really have no concerns um, in terms of the wild plants. Um, like stinging nettle might be a little harder for people to wrap their head around, for example, and fireweed has those uh, lateral rhizomous roots. So unless you have a good spot, it can spread a lot and people don't like that. Um, another one might be, so from a, we have, we're very lucky. We have a couple of really cool garden centers in Alberta and been right around Calgary that are native plant gardens. So you could plant wild onion, throw those in amongst your regular onion bed. Um, that's an easy one because an onion is an onion is an onion. So again, you won't have any troubles with adapting to the onion. Um, if you're of European ancestry, you're more familiar with the idea of bitters. So you might want to use goldenrod as your near bitters. Goldenrod is a fall flower. So it's nice to have things that flower in different seasons. And so you can harvest the leaves in different seasons. Um, yeah, those are just some simple, easy ones. Mm -hmm. Again, goldenrod doesn't have any toxic twins. Uh, if you like to throw in a bit of bitters into your stew, it's better cooked because it's a bit of a rough leaf um, and clean out your digestive system, which you could also do with dandelions. But if you want a native species, goldenrod's kind of like the, the dandelion of the native species, just in terms of the leaves and being a bitter. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So what, um, if people want to know more about you, about your company, how can they connect with you? How can they get on one of your walks? Yep. So but the website's uh, www.fullcircleadventures.com. And then the immediate drop down bar on the left says edible outdoors. And if you click on that, there's edible plant walks, there's edible forage outings where we actually go foraging together. There's edible plant hikes. So if you're a hiker and you wanna go hiking and just learn what's in your ecosystem. If you go over to edible wild at home, um, so if you own some property, we'll come out and do a walk about on your property and see what's edible. Uh, before COVID measures, we could also do one where we do foraging on your property and then go into your kitchen and cook it up. So there's different prices for those two types of programs. Um, so the plant walks are in the city and a lot of the city parks and Weaselhead and um, Edworthy and Glenmore and places like that. So it's learning to ID them. We don't forage in the city parks. We are foraging programs. We go out to public lands where you can forage and our hikes are also often in, you know, Kananaska's provincial parks where it's just learning, we'll sample, we will sample, but we definitely just learn more along the way. Yeah, I definitely, I wanna try some of that fireweed. Um, Julie, thank you so much for being here with me today, teaching me all about the amazing plants that we have around our beautiful province. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us and, um, you know, if you have any questions, definitely put them in the comments and myself or Julie can answer them. And um, I hope everyone has a great day and I will see you guys next week. Bye for now.